Assalamu alaikum. Here's my review of Guidance Residential, the number one Islamic home financing provider in the US. This is a company that boasts more than $10 billion in funding provided and over 35,000 families served. So a big player in the Islamic finance space. I'm going to review their product and let you know whether I think that their product is halal or haram. As always, the views I express are my own. Make sure to do your own due diligence before you make any decisions. Now, let's dive right in. The use case for Guidance's product is to finance home purchases. So let's say you want to buy a house that costs $500,000, but you only have $100,000 to spend. So you need a way to bridge that gap between the $100,000 you have and the $500,000 you need. The non-Islamic solution is to just go to a bank, take out a loan, and pay the bank back with interest. So going back to our example, I have 100000 I go to the bank, they lend me 400000 I promise to pay the bank back the 400000 with interest. And I use the 500000 I now have to purchase the house that I want. If you're a halal conscious consumer, this doesn't work because interest in Islam is haram, interest on debt. It's called riba, it's haram. It's prohibited very clearly in the Quran and Hadith. In fact, the Prophet, peace be upon him, cursed the one who pays interest, the one who collects it, and the two witnesses to the riba contract, the interest on loan contract. And in one narration, he said they're all the same. That is, they're all the same in the sin that they are guilty of. So Guidance claims that their product provides a solution for halal conscious consumers who need financing but don't want to use interest-bearing loans. And that their solution is 100% Sharia compliant, free of riba. So how does their model work? Well, their model is based on co-ownership and is referred to as diminishing musharaka. How it works from their site is Guidance Residential and home buyers each own a percentage as co-owners of the house. Home buyers increase their share over a period of time through a monthly payment. In this arrangement, the customer and Guidance co-own the property, with the customer buying out Guidance's share over time. So going back to our example of the $500,000 house, instead of going to the bank, you go to Guidance and you say, hey, my brothers and sisters, I only have $100,000, but I want to buy this house that costs $500,000. Can you provide $400,000 and buy four-fifths of the house? I'll buy one-fifth, you buy four-fifths, and then I'm going to live in the house. So during this time when I'm living in the house, I'll pay you rent based on the amount of the house that you still own. So I'm going to pay you rent and concurrently when I'm paying you rent, I'm going to be buying from you your share. So your share of the house is going to be decreasing with time and therefore the rent that I pay you is going to be decreasing with time. So with time, more of my payments are going to be going towards purchasing your share of the house and less of it is going to be going to rent. So it's just a rental agreement combined with a promise to purchase, right? Nothing wrong with those things. Both things are okay to do in Islam. There's no controversy about that. So doing them together is also okay, right? Wrong. Very wrong. Just because the components of something are halal doesn't mean the combination of them is also halal. If you're driving a car, that's completely halal. If someone is taking a sleeping pill, that is completely halal as well. Taking a sleeping pill while driving a car is not halal. It's reckless. It puts your life in danger, puts the life of others in danger. And therefore, this reckless act, which is endangering the lives of other people, including yourself, is haram. And my claim is that combining purchasing an asset with renting that same asset is in no practical way different from borrowing the money to buy the asset and paying interest on the loan that you borrowed. Now, before we make any conclusions, let's make sure to hear guidance out and see their argument for why they are different 
from an interest-bearing loan, why their solution is halal. And what I'm saying in terms of no practical differences is wrong. The first point that they mention is one of co-ownership. They say, we're co-owners with the borrower, so we're different. My response to that is, so what? What is the purpose of this co-ownership? The bottom line is that the customer is indebted to you with the remaining price of the house. The existence of a co-ownership arrangement at the start of the contract should not obscure from the fact that the customer at the end of the day is a borrower and guidance is a lender. If the customer fails to purchase guidance's share of the house, they are in default. So I find this co-ownership arrangement to be completely unnecessary. And to be honest, it seems that the only purpose it is serving is to obscure the heart of the transaction, which is a loan that is being made from guidance to the customer or the home buyer. The second differentiation they have listed is that their mortgage or their arrangement is RIBA free. They say it is 100% RIBA free. Well, that's what we're trying to ascertain. That's why we're going through this exercise. You're making a claim here, but so far, I can find no material differences between the rent that you're charging and the RIBA that a traditional bank would charge. Now you may be wondering, well, I thought rent was halal. What's wrong with rent? Yes, of course it is. As I mentioned, on its own, it is halal. But when you combine renting an asset with an obligation to purchase that asset, it becomes indistinguishable from a loan with interest. Let me give another example about how combining things may yield something different. Remember, fermenting on its own is not haram, it's halal. Grapes on their own are not haram to consume, they are halal. Fermenting grapes and consuming them is haram, that's consuming wine. The next listed point of differentiation for guidance is that they are a non-recourse commitment. This just means that if you default, they're only going to go after the house. They're not going to go after your other personal assets. However, there are many interest-based loans that are non-recourse. This does not make these interest-based loans halal. Islam does not prohibit interest-based debt only when the lender has recourse. Interest-bearing debt is haram, regardless of whether the lender has recourse or doesn't have recourse, regardless of whether the lender commits to only going after your house or they don't commit to that and may go after your personal assets. Regardless of any of that, interest-bearing loans are haram. The next point, they say they have capped late payment fees. Well, similar to the non-recourse argument, there are interest-bearing loans that have capped late payment fees. Does that make them halal to use? Of course not. Interest-bearing debt is haram to use regardless of whether the late payment fees are capped or not. The next point they mention is that they are risk sharing. And they mention the risk is shared if the property is lost in the case of a natural disaster or a public service project initiated by the government forces you out of the property. Well, the risk from a natural disaster is actually already mitigated by property insurance and also the risk of imminent domain or seizure by the government for public service work is typically muted by virtue of the fact that the government will compensate the homeowner in the very unlikely case that a homeowner is dispossessed of their property by the government. To be honest, my guess here is that if you were to round the percentage of homeowners where this feature actually came in handy, if you were to round that percentage to the nearest whole number, that number would be 0%. This is just a complete nothing burger feature, if I'm being completely honest. The next feature, they say, is that they have no prepayment penalty. Again, many interest-bearing loans have no prepayment penalty. 
Does that make them halal? Of course it doesn't. Next, they have an independent Sharia board. Well, this is not a feature of the mortgage itself. This may help guidance when they're marketing their product, but this is of very little practical use for the borrower. Also, with regards to the use of the word independent, what is meant by this word? Are you saying, is guidance claiming that at no point in time there were any payments made to any members of this Sharia board? I'm asking. I don't know what the answer is, but I didn't see that claim made. If by independent they mean that this Sharia board at no point was paid by guidance for their opinion, then they should say that explicitly. Otherwise, I don't really know what to make of the claim that this board is independent. Next, they say affiliation with a bank is non-existent for guidance, but it exists with traditional mortgages. Basically, they're saying that we're not owned by a bank. Other mortgages you'll get from an actual bank. Well, this doesn't make your product Sharia compliant. Also, are all businesses that are not owned by banks, are all their products Sharia compliant? And I would add that there are many non-bank mortgage providers, interest bank loan providers. Are these all halal now? The next point they say is that it's an equity partnership. And here they argue that they're basically not alone. They're a partnership. However, if you look towards the end of their argument, they say, oh yeah, by the way, we sell these partnerships to Freddie Mac. And this is a totally Sharia compliant thing for us to do. Well, Freddie Mac, if you look into it, it's a government sponsored entity that buys mortgages, pools them and then sells to investors in the form of mortgage-backed securities. The only thing that they seem to be allowed to purchase are conforming loans. This is mandated by the government. So this means that Freddie Mac looked at Guidance's agreements with his customers and said, yeah, this meets the requirements that we have for a conforming loan. And loans in Islam can only be one of two types. There is no third type. It's either charity or it's a Reba loan. There's no third type. The next point they make is that their product is endorsed by Amja, which is the American Muslim Jurist Association. Sorry, but Amja are not Quran or Sunnah. This cannot be used as proof of anything. It's good. It's something that, you know, when you get someone who has a background or has credibility to support your product, that's good, but it can't be used as proof. Finally, they say equal protection with LLC structure. Here, they just repeat the previously mentioned benefits of capped late payments and no prepayment penalties and non-recourse policies. Well, they'll just go after your house and won't go after your other assets in case of default. As mentioned, all of these features can be present in an interest-bearing loan. That doesn't make them halal. You can't make alcohol halal by offering it at a you know, really great price and it comes with a gym membership. Adding features to a haram product doesn't make it less haram. The core of the arrangement here, as I see it, is an interest-bearing loan. Adding other features that make it look better doesn't change the heart of the matter. To elaborate on my claim that the diminishing musharaka arrangement is nothing more than an interest-bearing loan, I provided my own comparison table. So we have on the left conventional mortgages and on the right diminishing musharaka. In conventional mortgages, the buyer is the owner of the house. The bank has a lien on the house and diminishing musharaka, the buyer is part owner and part renter. In conventional mortgages, the buyer is indebted with the remaining price of the house. Musharaka, the buyer is indebted with the remaining price of the house. In conventional mortgages, the home buyer pays interest based on the amount of their indebtedness. In diminishing musharaka, the home buyer pays rent based on the amount of their indebtedness. In a conventional mortgage, as the term of the mortgage progresses, the home buyers pay more principal and pay less interest. In diminishing musharaka, as the partnership progresses, the home buyer pays more towards owning the house and pays less in rent. 
the financing contract in conventional mortgages ends when the borrower has paid off the entire price of the house plus interest. The financing contract in diminishing musharaka ends when the renter has paid off the entire price of the house plus rent. You'll notice in these points of comparison that the word interest has been replaced with the word rent. And now my question to you is, is this the message that the Prophet, peace be upon him, struggled so much to deliver to us? Hey guys, please replace the word interest with rent. Was that his message? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, we have not sent you, speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, we have not sent you except out of mercy to everyone and everything. Where is the mercy that is present in this diminishing Musharaka contract that is not present in a traditional mortgage? And I would also argue that my stance is really validated by a third party, which is Freddie Mac, and the fact that they are buying these loans. Guidance mentions on their site that their unique declining balance co-ownership program was created under the guidance of seven globally renowned Sharia scholars and 18 U.S. law firms to ensure it meets strict adherence to legal jurisprudence of the Islamic faith and conforms to the U.S. legal and regulatory requirements. Now, this kind of on its own is a red flag to me. It shouldn't take so many people and so many law firms to validate that something is Sharia compliant. Guys, Sharia compliance is in fact not that complicated. As much as some people have a vested interest in making sure it always appears to be complicated, it's not. Once you understand the principles, it's actually pretty easy to ascertain. I invite anyone from guidance or their Sharia board or these 18 law firms to come on this channel and explain why I am wrong. Tell me, now's your chance. I have no vested interest in the outcome of my review. I'm perfectly willing to change my stance if I have erred in any way, although I highly doubt that I have. But come on the show and tell me why I'm wrong. Finally, I should say, and this is the case in all my reviews, just because I have an issue with a particular product doesn't mean I have an issue with the people behind the product. In the case of guidance, I don't know any of them. I'm perfectly willing to accept that the people behind this product were completely sincere when they came up with their product. I just think they got it wrong. People tune in to my videos primarily because of my good looks, but also because they trust me. And so I have to make sure not to betray their trust and give an objective review of any products that I'm reviewing. Moreover, I have a duty to my creator who will ask me on the day of judgment about my knowledge and what I did with it. As the prophet, peace be upon him, says in the famous hadith, I have some knowledge. I have to use it responsibly in an objective way, in an honest way. And that's what I try to do in my reviews. Like if you like, subscribe for more. Wassalam.